Where does the silver disc shape come from? Why are aliens short and gray? What's with the anal probes and how can I get abducted? If you want to know if the government is lying about aliens, look at what they can't hide. Dates and coincidences. The Roswell crash occurred on July 8, 1947. The army shipped the debris to Wright Field in Ohio. One day later, at Wright Field, Ohio, the army began the US government's first UFO investigation, Project Saucer. Hmm. The Holloman landing is a rumored meeting between President Eisenhower and extraterrestrials occurring in 1955, in which the US government made a deal with aliens in exchange for advanced technology. Coincidentally, 1955 was the same year a flying saucer project began, Area 51 was created, and the first anti-gravity research group was established. Hmm. 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 <laughs> Using evidence like dates, government docs, and books on the matter, we're going to look at people and events that shaped the lore America is still so obsessed with. My sources include Harvard Library, the NASA archives, and the truth will set you free .ufo net. Also note, uh, I won't mention every UFO sighting ever, and I'm going to avoid rabbit holes like the Illuminati, Hollow Earth, Reptilians, etc. In 1974, World War II vet and screenwriter for Walt Disney, Robert Spencer Carr stated, One of the best kept secrets of the United States government is that in Hangar 18 at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, there are two flying saucers of unknown origin. Hangar 18 is where the wreckage from the Roswell crash, alien or not, was taken. Materials were stored at Wright Field in Hangar 18, while a living alien was supposedly kept in the Blue Room. When curious Senator Barry Goldwater requested access to the room, a general furiously replied, don't ever ask me that question again. The biggest clue to Hangar 18 lies in the leaked documents regarding the Roswell crash. In 1980, UFO researcher and board member of APRO, William Bill Moore, received an anonymous phone call stating, we think you're the only one who knows what he's talking about. The man on the line, an Air Force officer at Kirtland Base named Richard Doty, stated he was part of a group that was unhappy with the Air Force's secrecy on the UFO subject. Moore and Doty met in a diner, and worried about hidden bugs, assigned themselves uh, code names of birds because birds eat bugs. With their new aviary group established, Rick Doty, aka Sparrow, gave Moore several files from Project Aquarius. Moore then met with his friend, fellow ufologist Paul Benowitz, in a broom closet to share the info, as ufologists do. The documents mention Project Aquarius and a group called MJ-12. Moore and Benowitz didn't know it yet, but MJ-12 had a lot to do with Roswell. Although the Roswell incident officially occurred in July 1947, rancher William Brazel found the debris in June, before the army and newspapers arrived. Brazel had seen two prior weather balloon crashes and stated, I am sure what I found was not any weather observation balloon. The army information office actually announced that they had gain possession of a flying saucer, and you can even see the memo in the officer's hand. When zoomed in, rotated, and enhanced, the words Fort Worth, Texas are visible. Fully transcribed, the memo mentions a disc and victims. Moore met with the officer in charge of recovery of the wreckage, Jesse Marcel. Marcel stated, General told the newsmen it was nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, we both knew different. He also took some debris home with him and woke his son up in the middle of the night, saying the boy needed to look at it because it was something he would never see again. Marcel's son recalled that, on the inner surface, there appeared to be a type of writing of a purple-violet hue. It had no resemblance to Russian, Japanese, or any other foreign language. It resembled hieroglyphics. The debris was inspected at Roswell Army Airfield and subsequently taken to higher headquarters. Pilot Oliver Henderson reportedly flew a plane loaded with debris, along with several small alien bodies, from Roswell to Wright Field. Fellow pilot Marion Magruder claimed to have seen a live alien die via experimentation at Wright Field. Take these statements with a salt lamp. There were closer bases than Wright Field to take the Roswell wreckage, so why take it there? Well, during World War II, a team called T-2 was tasked with identifying foreign aircraft and reverse engineering it. T2's headquarters were allegedly far underground at Wright Field. Their website reads, by the end of 1947, the Roswell date, Wright Field personnel had processed over 1,500 tons of documents. 
The technical knowledge gained revolutionized American industry. Engineer Alfred Letting patented a UFO design after leaving T2. Further suspicious, Wright-Patterson would be the headquarters for Project Saucer, the first UFO investigation by the US government. It would also host Project Grudge and Blue Book, each investigation larger than the last. So Aquarius relates to extraterrestrials, and Wright-Patterson is maybe hiding something. But what does MJ-12 mean? In 1984, Moore was flown by an anonymous caller to a New York hotel where a bellhop handed him an envelope, demanding it back in 19 minutes. Inside were rolls of film which Moore quickly photographed. The resulting images of the now famous MJ-12 document read, Operation Majestic 12 is a top secret R&D intelligence operation responsible directly and only to the President of the United States. The document affirms that the Roswell incident is in fact what began Project Sign. The Air Force's Roswell statement denies this, but agrees that if an advanced foreign craft were recovered, even alien, it would indeed be taken to right field. Twelve names of prominent scientists, political, and military leaders are listed. They are the Majestic Twelve. The document describes nine flying disc-shaped aircraft traveling in formation at a high rate of speed over Washington in June 1947, witnessed by pilot Kenneth Arnold. Arnold was the first person to use the term flying saucer. The document cites public hysteria and the government's unfruitful attempts to learn more via research and interviews. In spite of these efforts, little of substance was learned about the objects until a local rancher reported that one had crashed in a remote region of New Mexico near Roswell Army Air Base. On the 7th of July 1947, a secret operation was begun to assure recovery of the wreckage of the object for a scientific study. During the course of this operation, aerial reconnaissance discovered that four small human-like beings had apparently ejected from the craft at some point before it exploded. These had fallen to Earth about two miles east of the wreckage site. All four were dead and badly decomposed. A special scientific team took charge of removing these bodies for study. The wreckage of the craft was also removed to several different locations. Civilian and military witnesses in the area were debriefed, and news reporters were given the effective cover story that the object had been a misguided weather research balloon. A covert analytical effort of the four dead occupants was arranged. Although these creatures are human-like in appearance, the biological and evolutionary processes responsible for their development has apparently been quite different from those observed or postulated in Homo sapiens. Since it is virtually certain that these craft did not originate in any country on Earth, considerable speculation is centered around what their point of origin may be and how they get here. Mars was and remains a possibility. Although some scientists, most notably Dr. Menzel, considers it more likely that we are dealing with beings from another solar system entirely. Numerous examples of what appear to be a form of writing were found in the wreckage. Efforts to decipher these have remained largely unsuccessful. Equally unsuccessful have been efforts to determine the method of propulsion or power source involved. Research along these lines has been complicated by the complete absence of identifiable wings, propellers, jets, or other conventional methods of propulsion and guidance, as well as a total lack of metallic wiring. It is assumed that the propulsion unit was completely destroyed by the explosion which caused the crash. The motives and ultimate intentions of these visitors remains completely unknown. In addition, a significant upsurge in the surveillance activity of these craft has caused considerable concern that new developments may be imminent. The ultimate need is to avoid a public panic at all costs. At the same time, Contingency Plan MJ 1949 should be held in continued readiness should the need to make a public announcement present itself. A key clue to this document is the line, the wreckage of the craft was removed to several different locations. And while one of those locations was Wright Field, Moore's friend Benowitz was about to find the second location. Paul Benowitz was a retired pilot and business owner who made scientific equipment for NASA and the Air Force. In the early 80s, the FBI was in his hometown of Albuquerque to investigate a cattle mutilation epidemic. In a local case, a young calf had cuts that appeared to have been made with sharp and precise instruments. Both the liver and the heart were white and mushy. Both organs had the texture and consistency of peanut butter. Lab reports showed the presence of chemicals not normally found in animals. 
The scientists performing the analysis were unable to explain these anomalies. It was suggested that a burst of radiation may have been used to kill the animal, blowing apart its red blood cells in the process. At a town hall to discuss the issue, Benowitz was put into contact with Myrna Hansen, who claimed she'd been abducted by a craft. Benowitz flew in psychologist Leo Sprinkle, who had experience with abductions. Sprinkle's prior patient stated she saw a calf dissected on a craft with quick precision before the carcass was dropped back on the ground in a process she called methodical. She described the abductors as little men, gray creatures with large egg-shaped heads. Recalling pain, she says, they don't listen, they just ignore me, go about their work as if it's nothing. They don't seem to have any emotions, they don't seem to care. Myrna told a similar story under hypnosis, and Benowitz began to suspect something strange was going on in Albuquerque. With additional sessions, Myrna recalled being taken to an underground base, seeing body parts floating in vats, and having a device implanted. Myrna was x-rayed, and the object did in fact show up, but was dismissed as a natural growth. In addition to mutilations and abductions, Benowitz was noticing strange lights near his home. They swooped and darted over the Manzano mountain range, near Kirtland Air Force Base, which just happened to house the Manzano Bunker, a nuclear storage and research facility built into the side of the Manzano Mountains. Construction on the facility began the same year and month as the Roswell incident, although I can't confirm the exact day. The Air Force and Atomic Energy Commission initiated one of the most extensive underground building projects in history. The FBI was checking backgrounds and clearing new employees as fast as they could so that workers could be shuttled out to the Manzano Mountains. Benowitz and Moore even received a letter from an Air Force cadet who said that he knew the Air Force was keeping the remains of a crashed UFO in the Manzano storage complex. Being a scientist, Benowitz set up surveillance equipment and scanned the area, detecting electromagnetic signals right beside the Manzano facility, coming from Coyote Canyon. He called Kirtland Base, citing a security threat, and the head of security at Kirtland, Rick Doty, Moore's contact, arrived at Benowitz's business. He was astonished by the mountain of surveillance equipment that he saw, and Benowitz was invited to give a briefing at the base. He brought every piece of evidence he had collected and presented to the top brass, but as he began to mention UFOs and ETs, the Air Force officers began to leave until only a small group of scientists remained. Benowitz ended his presentation with a request for funding to continue his research, and was granted $75,000 with an emphasis on finding the origin of the mysterious signals. Benowitz, now with air support, got to work. Meanwhile, Moore received new intel from Doty. The Kirtland documents, a now declassified report, detail UFO sightings by guards in the Kirtland base, Coyote Canyon, and Manzano Mountain areas. August 8, 1980, three security policemen from Kirtland Air Force Base were on duty inside the Manzano weapons storage area. The guards were interviewed, and all three related the same statement. At approximately 2300 hours, the three observed a bright light in the sky. The light traveled with great speed and stopped suddenly in the sky over Coyote Canyon. They first thought the object was a helicopter, however, after observing the strange aerial maneuvers, stop and go, they felt a helicopter couldn't have performed such skills. August 11th, a security guard was driving east on the Coyote Canyon access road on a routine building check. He observed a similar light, and after driving closer, he observed a round disc-shaped object. He attempted to radio for backup patrol, but his radio would not work. As he approached the object on foot, armed with a shotgun, the object took off in a vertical direction at a high rate of speed. The guard was a former helicopter mechanic in the U.S. Army, and stated the object he observed was not a helicopter. August 13th, Kirtland Base and Albuquerque Airport radar became inoperable due to high frequency radar jamming from an unknown cause. Base police are sent to investigate. At first, the nearby Sandia Laboratory was suspected, but was found to be conducting no tests in the area at the time. The source was tracked to the northwest of Coyote Canyon test area. Communication maintenance specialists cannot explain how such interference could cause the radar equipment to become totally inoperable. At 22.16 hours, all radar equipment returned to normal operation without further incident. Benowitz's senator and Apollo 17 astronaut Harrison Schmidt, the one who held the town hall on the mutilations, demanded entry into Kirtland Base to get answers, but he was stopped at the gate and denied entry, as he didn't have a need-to-know basis. 
Benowitz became increasingly concerned that the UFOs seemed attracted to and able to render inoperable military defenses. He worriedly wrote to the director of APRO, but received no response. The Air Force became disinterested in Benowitz's work, however, and in a report they stated, the evidence clearly shows some type of unidentified aerial objects were caught on film. However, no conclusion could be made whether these objects pose a threat to the Manzano or Coyote Canyon areas. A week later, the Air Force officials told Benowitz they would not be investigating any further. He continued without them at a personal cost of $200,000. With special access to restricted airspace provided by Doty, who works at the base, Benowitz flew surveillance missions around the Manzano Mountains, photographing crash debris from a possible atomic-powered alien craft including Black Ship Delta, a supposed U.S. craft utilizing alien technology. Using custom-built equipment, he was beginning to pick up radio messages, and using his own software, he decoded the transmissions and converted different pulses into words. Although appearing like someone used a random word generator, for example, Victory, our bases obtain supplies from the Starship Metal Time is Yanked, Time is Yanked message hit, some fragments are more decipherable. Here are the most complete sentences. Using rejuvenation methods got us in trouble. Women are not needed in our society. Many on our side universe will contact you in unique way. We've been trying to contact you about your car's extended warranty. Military of US delivered embryos making humanoids. Our number of crashed saucers is eight. We come invisible, will not join sides with anyone. Our race is dying on the home planet. What Benowitz would discover next was the result of an alleged deal between the U.S. government and the ETs. In February 1954, President Eisenhower disappeared while on vacation in Palm Springs, California. The media declared he had died, while a spokesman claimed he had visited a dentist after chipping his tooth on a fried chicken with the hardness of bedrock. Eisenhower supposedly snuck off to Edwards Air Force Base, where a craft landed. He entered and discussed a peace treaty with Nordic beings, blue eyes and colorless lips, on the condition of voluntary nuclear disarmament. Eisenhower refused, believing it was the only defense the U.S. had against an extraterrestrial threat. Before the meeting ended, the Nords warned him, the Greys are not to be trusted. Moore went to the Eisenhower Library and found that although the library maintains an extensive index on the president's health, there is no record of any dental work having been performed during February 1954. A year later, in 1955, there was a second meeting, this time at Holloman Air Force Base. According to Paul Shartle, AV manager at Norton Air Force Base, there was footage of three disc-shaped crafts. One of the craft landed and two of them went away. The craft oscillated all the way down to the ground and a sliding door opened. A ramp was extended and out came three aliens with odd gray complexions. They wore tight-fitting jumpsuits and in their hands they held a translator. The Holloman base commander and other Air Force officers went out to meet them. These beings were the Greys, who told them that their planet was dying. According to a Benowitz contact, they hail from Zeta Reticuli, a binary star system. This is the same star system drawn by famous abductee Betty Hill, who drew a, a sketch of what she saw aboard a craft. It was with these aliens that Eisenhower would sign a treaty. Known as the Granada Treaty, it would give the US a craft of technology 30 years old by the alien standards. In exchange, the US would allow them to abduct a very small number of persons, given they provide a list of those abducted. Army officer Philip J. Corso, serving under Eisenhower, notes the scientific progress made in the fields of night vision from the aliens' eyes, Kevlar from their suits, and integrated circuits from their craft. This significant year of 1955 is also the year Area 51 began construction, a flying saucer was commissioned, and the government's first anti-gravity research paper was published. In 1972, two film producers were approached by the Air Force about making a documentary on UFOs with the goal of gradually acclimating the public to the existence of extraterrestrial life. The producers were invited to the Pentagon and shown movies and stills of gray aliens, including one who they said survived a crash and lived for three years. 
They also met with the head of the Air Force, Office of Special Investigations, Richard Doty, who offered them footage of a saucer landing at Holloman. Production was canceled following the Watergate scandal, as the political conditions were not right. A decade later, Emmy-winning director Linda Moulton Howe was writing a UFO documentary for HBO. When approached by Doty, a tense and nervous Doty hurriedly led Howe into an office at Kirtland Base, where he handed her a document, saying she could read and ask questions, but she could not take notes. It listed dates and locations of retrievals of UFOs and their occupants. The 1947 Roswell crash was mentioned in the documents, as well as another crash in 1949. Investigators at the site found five bodies and one living alien, who was taken to a safe house at Los Alamos National Laboratories. The aliens were known as extraterrestrial biological entities, so the living one was called Eba. Eba was befriended by an Air Force officer but the being died of unknown causes after three years. HBO refused to greenlight the film until it had the signature of the president, and the government refused to hand over the footage until it had HBO's full commitment. Howe's contract ran out before the project got off the ground. In 1977, Steven Spielberg screened Close Encounters of the Third Kind with President Reagan. The film apparently closely mirrors the Holloman landing. Rumor states that after the screening, Reagan pulled Spielberg aside and said, people don't know just how close you came to the truth. Benowitz and Moore, meanwhile, were searching for an underground joint military alien base. An anonymous note told them, something interesting is going on in Dulce. Dulce, New Mexico is a small town bordering Colorado and home to a large Apache reservation. There are strange lights and stories that came from the Indian tribe that lives up there. If you think the idea of a secret underground base is dumb, that's because it is. The Cheyenne Mountain Complex in Colorado is one example of a dumb, a deep underground military base. It's even complete with cozy officer sleeping quarters, a gym, cafeteria, medical facility, command center, and even a 7-Eleven. Benowitz begins studying the Dulce area. To create a large underground facility would require workers, and despite being sworn to secrecy, two alleged employees at Dulce have spoken out. Explosives engineer Phil Schneider claimed to have worked on a secret underground project in Dulce, New Mexico in 1979. He first became suspicious when he noticed American Special Forces soldiers operating in and around the area. He describes a fight that broke out between Special Forces and aliens that left 60 people dead, called the Dulce Battle. Schneider frequently told friends and family, if I die, it wasn't by suicide. He died by suicide in 1996 via a catheter hose around his neck. Tom Costello claimed to have worked security at Dulce Base until 1979. He commuted to work via an underground shuttle, one labeled to Los Alamos, while another he suspected led under Area 51. Costello's descriptions of the activities carried out at the base include experiments into telepathy, dreams and hypnosis, as well as research into human auras. Apparently, the aliens have the capability to replace an alien life force within a human body after removing the soul. Genetic experiments were carried out on a variety of life forms, including fish, birds, mice, seals, and even humans, on level 6, aka Nightmare Hall. Level 7 contained row upon row of thousands of humans, human mixture remains, and embryos of humanoids, kept in cold storage. Costello says, I frequently encountered humans in cages. Usually they were dazed or drugged, but sometimes they cried and begged for help. We were told they were hopelessly insane and involved in high-risk drug tests to cure insanity. We were told never to speak to them at all. The cattle mutilations generally result in all the blood being drained from the body. The greys have in their bases canisters and vats in which human and animal organs float along with a purple liquid to hold these parts in suspension. The greys swim in the mixture and absorb the nutrients through their skin. In 1979, Costello decided he could not tolerate working at the complex any longer. Before leaving, he took photos and documents, known as the Dulce Papers, and dispersed them to the UFO community. The information in the Dulce Papers comprised of 25 black and white photos, a videotape with no dialogue, and a set of papers that included technical information of the alleged jointly occupied facility. Meanwhile, the Granada Treaty was contingent on the gray aliens providing a list of those abducted. However, according to Naval Intelligence Officer William Cooper, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. It was suspected that not all of the abductees had been returned. 
Aware of these leaks, Benowitz wrote to President Reagan, but was ignored. Skeptical of the military's efforts to help him, his first clue was a line in the Aquarius documents that read, Case on Benowitz is being monitored by NASA slash INS. He also noticed government agents move in across the street, even breaking into his office to steal photos. He wrote to the Pentagon, stating that, despite his cooperation, Air Force Intelligence chose to place me under electronic and personal surveillance, in addition to phone taps on all lines. He adds, Copies of this letter, along with other data, has been distributed to key individuals in the event of my demise. Benowitz began sleeping with a 45 pistol under his pillow. In a letter to the APRO director, Benowitz states that he is picking up pictures now, alien faces, ships, clouds, cities from the air and on their bases. In late 1981, convinced of an invasion only he could stop, Benowitz compiled all of his research into a document he dubbed Project Beta. In apparent communication with an alien, Benowitz writes, The location of an underground base was divulged by the alien and precisely pinpointed. All encounter victims have deliberate alien implants, along with obvious accompanying scars, verified by X-ray and CAT scan. Aerial and ground photographs revealed landing pylons, ships on the ground, entrances, beam weapons, and apparent launch ports. On the slope of Mount Archuleta, trucks and jeeps can be seen. I don't believe aliens have wheels, humans do. Prior alien communication had indicated military involvement and the fact that the United States Air Force has a ship, actually more than one. Two were wrecked and left behind and another built. This ship is atomic powered and flying. It is important to note at the outset, the alien is devious, employs deception, and has no intent of any apparent peacemaking process, and obviously does not adhere to any prior arranged agreement. In truth, they tend to lie. However, their memory for lying is not long, therefore much drops through the cracks, and from this comes the apparent truth. The Greys were still upset about the capture and subsequent death of the first eight of their co-fellows, a conservative guess based on the number of ships presently over this area and on the ground, the total alien population at this point is at least 2,000 and likely more. The alien indicates more are coming or on the way. Benowitz then lists discoveries of what makes the alien run. The alien will allow no one to go without an implant. They simply will not allow it. The victim's switch can be pulled at any time and they are walking cameras and microphones. If this has happened to the military, I need not elaborate as the possible consequences. However, realize the scars, barely visible, can be seen. Most importantly, the aliens will exhibit tendencies for bad logic, so they are not infallible. They are not to be trusted. It is suspected if one was considered a friend, and if one were to call upon that friend in time of dire physical threat, the friend would quickly side with the other side. The alien does kill with the beam, generally. It appears the humanoids are fed by a formula made from, all caps, human or cattle material. They are picking up and cutting, as the alien calls it, many people every night. Each implanted individual ready for the pull of their switch. Weaponry and inherent weaknesses. One tends to look at their machines and say there is no defense or offense. In particular, the beam weapons. It is an electrostatic weapon with plasma generating voltages, powered by hydrogen and oxygen, works best when dry. If it is raining, the weapon becomes ineffective. This should be considered in any future potential offensive strike against the base. On the discs and saucers, the weapon is generally on the left side or top center and has a maximum range of 200 meters, at which point it will plow a trench in desert soil. When fired, it fires both to the front and to the back equally. If equilibrium is not maintained, the saucer will spin out. Hand weapons, question mark? Not too much velocity nor staying power, but at short range, deadly. At one meter range, it can vaporize metal. Aircraft helicopter vulnerability. Any of our aircraft, helicopters, or missiles can be taken down instantly with no use of weaponry. The aliens simply need do no more than make one invisible pass, and their bow wave will take the vehicle down. The pilot will not even know what hit him. Advanced infrared scanners may be used to detect cloaked alien ships before they have a chance to attack. If the alien's plan goes even slightly out of balance or context, they become confused. The same applies to their mission. If pushed out of context, it will come apart. They will be exposed to the world, so they will possibly run before they will fight in the open. 
They definitely do not want that to happen. They are dependent upon the Navajo River for water. Without water, they have no power. Without power, no oxygen or hydrogen to service the ships and weapons. No water to sustain the organs and feeding formula. There is a water intake and there is a dam upstream that can be totally cut off. Once the bases are pressed on a large scale, all disks and saucers will go airborne immediately. Troops on the ground can gain terrain cover to quite a degree. Our need is for a weapon. It must penetrate their screens and it must also penetrate the ground. I believe I have that weapon. Two small prototypes have been funded and constructed by my company. Attack phases. Once deprived totally of water for a minimum period of four weeks, conditions in the alien bases will have badly deteriorated. Psychological shock is extremely effective with the alien. They will launch most, if not all, ships. The weapons should be deployed at strategic hardened locations. The disks will be made to stay airborne. They cannot land in the interval the system is powered. At the end of four to five weeks, all weapons should be totally discharged. Most personnel will be totally incapacitated. The feeding formula will be down and its critical processing ruined. All alien embryos should be dead. At that point, standard weapon technology can come into play. Communications can be used to attempt to instigate surrender. If no response results, they should simply be closed in and waited out. This basing area is key. Without it, their mission is in very deep trouble. It is noted that they are not the only bases on Earth. There are others. They totally respect force. Negotiation is out. In conclusion, they cannot, under any circumstances, be trusted. They are totally deceptive and death-oriented and have no moral respect for human life. Moore says, I watched Paul become systematically more emotionally unstable. He had installed extra locks on his doors, and he swore that they were coming through his walls at night and injecting him with hideous chemicals, which would knock him out for long periods of time. He would then wake up in the middle of the night in the middle of the desert. He wasn't eating or sleeping, and once smoked 28 cigarettes in 45 minutes. He had trouble expressing a coherent thought. He was placed in a mental facility by his family. One of Benowitz's sources stated, Project Snowbird was initiated to enable us to learn how to fly the alien craft preparatory to our constructing one. Project Snowbird continues at Area 51. The goal of the Avro car was was to create a VTOL craft, vertical takeoff and landing. The Russians could see large runways from space, so the US had to invent a craft that could take off and land vertically. After pondering what such a device would look like, they settled on a UFO, stating, This project should in no way be associated with any science fiction or flying saucer stories because of its external appearance. And in fairness, the blueprints look like a standard aircraft. Of course, a UFO can do one thing a helicopter can't, go to space. And that's very apparent in the project documents. The NASA flight testing will continue beyond the Air Force tests since a longer program is planned. And the program will be allowed to proceed regardless of the status of the wind tunnel testing. And that brings us to the most famous alien site. You already know it, that's right, S4. Robert Bob Lazar began his career as a propulsion scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratories where Robert Oppenheimer developed the first atomic bombs. Lazar gained local media attention after outfitting his 79 Honda Civic hatchback with jet engines and was approached by a defense contractor, EG&G, for a secretive job. After passing an interview and a polygraph, Lazar was bussed with blacked out windows to Papoose Lake, a dry lake bed just behind the mountains of Area 51. His office was S4 a facility built into the Papoose mountain range with sand-coated hangar doors that made the entrance invisible from the air. Lazar saw nine craft, each with a bay door, and gave them nicknames like the Sport Model or the Jello Mold. He notes, one of them looked like it was hit with some sort of projectile. His partner Barry showed him the core of the craft and told him to try to touch it, to which Lazar says he was repelled like a magnet. Barry tells him an explosion killed two former scientists when they attempted to cut into it, and the incident was recorded as a routine explosions test. Lazar describes the interior of the craft as lacking any metallic wiring. The cockpit contained three small seats, far too small for an adult, 
and its gravity amplifiers were powered by element 115. And in 1983, it was not on the periodic table. As of 2003, however, it has been created by colliding calcium and americium. The aliens, an open secret at the facility, were referred to as the kids. And to Lazar's knowledge, came from the binary star system Zeta Reticuli. When journalist George Knapp contacted Los Alamos to confirm Lazar's employment, they claimed to have no record of him. Knapp states, We called Los Alamos again. An exasperated official told us he still has no records on Lazar. Knapp persisted, eventually finding an internal Los Alamos phone book listing Lazar Robert. In the 2018 film, Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers, the dictionary definition of a hipster asks Lazar if he took any Element 115 home from S4. Lazar declines to answer, and his business is subsequently raided by the FBI. Discrepancies include the ID badges used at Los Alamos in the 80s that do not match his. Lazar also referred to the alien fuel as being designated LA-1000 in internal records. We now know that LA-1000 is a plutonium-aluminium alloy. After a lot of searching, the only thing I found on S4 was an inspection of the site by a higher up from Wright Field the day after Roswell. Now back to Benowitz. Obviously, an invasion didn't happen, unless the lizard people still walk among us. They do. So what was Paul freaking out about? Well, Richard Sparrow Doty was trained in deception using Nazi and Soviet playbooks, and worse yet, an insurance salesman tactics intended to win a person's trust. It was Doty who visited Benowitz wearing a hidden camera and arranged a meeting at Kirtland Base. And he wasn't worried about aliens, more so the possible Russian spy surveying aircraft projects. It was the NSA across the street beaming sci-fi movies into Benowitz's monitors. It was also the NSA that shut down the Kirtland base with their tests, and thanks to Benowitz's snooping, they had to admit it was them. William Moore himself was likely the author of the MJ-12 documents, due to his writing style. The reports coming from the Manzano storage facility in Coyote Canyon were likely Doty. Doty also fooled Linda Moulton Howe, and Air Force employees were watching her through two-way glass during their meeting. APRO was so humiliated, they ceased operations. In 1994, Doty became a consultant on The X-Files, contributing to episodes Anasazi, involving alien bodies found near a Navajo reservation in New Mexico, and Paperclip involving a scientist creating alien-human hybrids. Think what you will of Doty's truthfulness, but there are some things that even he couldn't explain. Like the injection marks on Benowitz's arms, or a floating ball of light in his office that the NSA was equally clueless about. In an interview with George Knapp, he states, The documents were fake, but I never said the info was. They don't have the clearances and need to know. I did. The CIA currently exempts Doty from FOIA disclosure on the grounds of national security. He even published a snarky book titled Exempt from Disclosure. In 2002, Gary McKinnon was arrested for the biggest military computer hack of all time, illegally accessing computers of the Army, Navy, Air Force, DOD, and NASA. Donna Hare worked at NASA's Johnson Space Center, Building 8, around this time. She claimed to witness photographic experts airbrush out UFOs from satellite imaging, and in some cases, burn photos. She even testified before Congress on the matter. McKinnon heard about this and, using his special access, searched for Building 8 of the Johnson Space Center. He found folders named raw and filtered and loaded a raw image stating what came up was a picture of something that definitely wasn't man-made. It was above the Earth's hemisphere, no rivets, no seams, none of the stuff associated with normal man-made manufacturing. I also got access to Excel spreadsheets, one titled non-terrestrial officers. U.S. cyber law was suddenly updated. Six months of community service turned into 60 years of prison. Thanks to Theresa May, however, the U.S. was unable to extradite McKinnon, and he is free today. Writing this video, I was certain the UAPs like the gimbal and Tic Tac were simply Chinese drones. But the shape of these objects bear little resemblance to Chinese drones. And that's not even addressing the speed and maneuverability. The latest release is the 2021 ATIP report. Airborne clutter like birds and balloons was dismissed even in the report, as they cannot exceed the sound barrier. Atmospheric events are not, according to the report, the physical objects detected by multiple sensors. Head of the project Luis Elizondo states, 
it isn't the US, of course, and that no other country could possibly have these observed capabilities. So that leaves us with the only remaining answer, other. Elizondo says a storage facility was constructed to store anything found during the project, and to his knowledge, there are advanced materials there now. If you like learning about spooky science and history, click the red subscribe button below, and more of these videos will appear in your feed. If you didn't like the video, downvote it to hell with that thumbs down button. Thanks for watching, and know that a gray alien will be watching you through the window while you sleep tonight.